Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church on this Mission Festival Sunday. Today we get to celebrate the gospel and what it does not just here but throughout the entire world. Last week we talked about how Jesus wants us to be humble servants. Well, today we're going to look at how humble servants, they don't look to glorify themselves, they look to glorify the gospel and help spread it to everyone. We'll also celebrate the Lord's Supper today, so prepare your minds and hearts to receive the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Now, this is a meal where we celebrate our unity in the faith, so if you haven't expressed that unity yet through church membership, please speak with me after the service. I'd love to talk to you about how we can make that happen. Now, as part of the service today, you'll notice some other languages are printed in the bulletin, and you'll even hear one later on. So just know that that is meant to highlight the fact that this is a message that truly goes throughout the world and across all cultures. That's what we'll celebrate, especially as we praise God. We're not going to be the only ones. With our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory, hymn 399. May God bless your worship today. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We ask for God's continued mercy. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. pray. Mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts, that your gospel may be known and your name be praised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. This Mission Festival Sunday, we go to our first lesson in Numbers chapter 11. Here we see that Moses very well could have looked to his own glory, but he didn't. He was focused on people knowing God and was just happy about that. The language you see there is Telugu. It's one of the national languages found in India. But I'll read the English, don't worry. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather 70 men from the elders of Israel for me men whom you know to be elders and officers for the people. Take them to the tent of meeting and make them stand there with you. Moses went out and told the people the Lord's words. He gathered 70 men from the elders of the people and had them stand all around the tent. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him. He took from the spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. 
Two men, however, remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tent. The Spirit rested on them, and they prophesied back in the camp. A young man ran and reported this to Moses. He said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide from his youth, answered, My Lord Moses, stop them. Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? If only all of the Lord's people were prophets, so that the Lord would put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord. The second lesson comes from Philippians chapter 1. Here we see Paul talk about the glory that can come from humbly preaching Christ and just focusing on that. The language you see there is Chinese, specifically Mandarin. I want you to know, brothers, that the things which happened to me actually took place to advance the gospel. And so it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to all the rest that I am in chains because of Christ. And through my chains, the majority of the brothers in the Lord have become much more confident about daring to speak the word of God fearlessly. Some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, and others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am placed here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking they can cause trouble for me while I am in chains. What does it matter? Only this, that in every way, whether for outward appearance or for the truth, Christ is being proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. The word of the Lord. Now please stand in honor of the gospel lesson. The gospel for today comes from Mark chapter 9. This will also serve as the sermon text for today. The language you see there is the original Greek of what was written here in Mark. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not try to stop him, because no one who does a miracle in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil about me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Amen, I tell you. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, will certainly not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall into sin, it would be better for him if he were thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around his neck. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, How will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, How Great Thou Art, number 256.
God's great grace and mercy is with you, brothers and sisters, as is the gospel that he has placed in your heart. Amen. Sermon text for today, as I said, comes from the gospel lesson in Mark chapter 9. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open our hearts and our minds to your word so that we can understand exactly what you've given us to be and do. Amen. Do you taste that? It's like it's in the air. Have you ever been at the ocean before? And when you're at the ocean, it's like you can like taste the salt in the air. Do you know what I mean? It's like there's the smell and this taste. Some people talk about how they really like that because it just tells them, ah, they're at the ocean. They even look forward to it when they're going. That you know, two, three blocks away, you start to kind of taste it, and just makes you excited about where you're about to be. But that's not the only thing salt makes taste better. Raise your hand if you've got a salt and pepper shaker on your dining room table or in your kitchen. All right. Oh, there's more of you than that. I know. When I cook, I'm, I'm really terrible, and everything I I cook is is bland and tasteless. But you add a little bit of salt and voila. It's flavorful, it's palatable, you can actually eat it. But you know that's not all, all that salt does. Salt is also used to purify things. It's also used to preserve things like food. Salt does a lot of things. Salt is good. That's why Jesus uses it as a picture for the gospel. The gospel is like salt. It adds flavor to things. It purifies and it preserves. So how salty are you? I don't mean how mean and grumpy you are. That's a different kind of salty. I mean how gospel focused are you? How much has the gospel done things and doing things for you right now? Sadly, you and I know that we're not as salty as we can be in our Christian living. Instead, we can be a little bland and flavorful, flavorless. So Jesus has an encouragement for us today, and that is to let the gospel do its thing, to make us salty. And we'll see that not just doesn't affect our lives, it also affects those around us as well. The disciples weren't having the saltiest chapter here in Mark 9. They had been confused about not being able to cast a demon out of a boy. They weren't understanding what Jesus was saying about his betrayal, his death, and his resurrection. And then they were arguing with each other about who was the greatest. Now when Jesus addressed that and, and gave them the idea of, no, we are to be humble servants, that's what we talked about last week, this seemed to have plucked the disciple John's conscience a little bit because he, he makes a confession to Jesus. Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. They saw someone actually driving out demons in Jesus' name, and they told him to stop. Why? Well, because he wasn't part of their group. They were supposed to be the ones who were being taught by Jesus himself. They were supposed to be the ones who could cast out evil spirits. And now they couldn't cast one out, and, and some unknown person could. So they were overcome with jealousy. And in their jealousy, they had told this man to stop doing what, they, what he was doing. What were they focused on? They weren't focused on the gospel. They weren't focused on the trust that this man was building in Jesus' name. They weren't focused on the glory that it was bringing Jesus' name. No, they were focused on themselves. They wanted the glory. They wanted the honor. They wanted the attention. So in their jealousy, they told this man to stop. Instead of actually helping to spread the flavor and saltiness of the gospel, they had actually stifled it. That's like you and I, if we went to another church and we said to them, hey now, 
Stop preaching about Jesus, all right, because you're not Wells. All right, only we have the gospel. Only we can really do that. Now, that's a, a crazy example, but you and I still can have that jealousy in our hearts, can't we, about other church bodies? We can see that, well, they're not part of our fellowship, and, and we have this gospel, and yet look at all the people walking through their doors. They're getting the attention. Why not us? So we can almost view them like they're our enemies. Instead of glorifying in the fact that they're learning about Jesus, that they're hearing God's word, we can instead be jealous. In that case, what are we focusing on? Focusing on ourselves and our own glory. Jesus doesn't want us to focus on that. He wants us to focus on the gospel. And the disciples weren't doing that, and so Jesus wanted to let them know. This man was casting out demons. They had told him to stop. Do not try to stop him, Jesus said, because no one who does a miracle in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil about me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Amen, I tell you. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, will certainly not lose his reward. Whoever is not against us is for us. Jesus graciously associates with other Christians the same way he graciously associates with you and me. You and I aren't to worry about those types of things that focus on ourselves. No, we're to focus on instead the gospel. And anything done in the gospel, even if somebody gives a, a cup of cold water or some simple little thing in the name of Jesus, God will give them a reward for that someday. Grace on top of grace. Who are we to think that we're going to be the only ones to receive rewards? Who are we to think that we're the only ones with the salt of the gospel? Instead of analyzing others, Jesus wants to do what? wants us to analyze ourselves. See, as the disciples were worrying about this man casting out a demon, Jesus, Jesus did what he always did with them. When they had an issue with someone else, he kind of turned it around on them. So, oh, you're all worried about this man and what he's doing and analyzing and, and concerned about him. Well, well, what about you? Are you doing something that is taking away from the glory of the gospel? Are you sinning? Are you causing someone else to sin? Because now that's, that's a serious issue. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall into sin, it would be better for him if he were thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around his neck. We need to be concerned first and foremost with, am I bringing glory to the gospel? And if I'm not, am I causing someone to sin because of what I'm doing? Because if I am causing someone else to stumble in their faith, Jesus says it's better if I have a millstone hung around my neck and I was drowned in the sea before it ever even happened. It's heightened language, but he's making a point here. He wants us to go into things with the attitude of, I would rather die than to cause someone else to stumble in their faith or even fall from the faith. That is the attitude Jesus wants us to have when it comes to helping the gospel and its cause. We get rid of anything that hinders that. And to stress that point even more, Jesus says this to his disciples. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go, and go into hell into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Is it really the, the hand or the foot or the eye that causes us to sin? No, because what about the other hand, the other foot, the other eye? Jesus isn't telling us to dismember ourselves. But once again, this is heightened language. He's saying, do whatever it takes to get rid of that sin out of your life. Is it a person in your life or a relationship? 
that is causing you to sin? Is it a phone or some other piece of technology or some other thing? Is it a sinful attitude or a sinful desire that's affecting you and those around you? Is it something that you just want to cling to? It could even be something that is good. But you doing that is hurting you or someone else. And Jesus says, cut it off. Gouge it out. Get rid of it. Do whatever you have to do. Because what happens when you don't? It's not just a bland and flavorless life then. Sin is rotten. And it eats away at things. And that rottenness can spread to others. And consider where that rottenness leads. Jesus stretched that big time here. And to do that, he uses some very strong pictures of hell. That's where the sin leads. And when Jesus describes hell, he uses cultural context, and then he also uses a, a passage from the book of Isaiah. He, had, he calls hell the unquenchable fire. That's a note to the word in the Greek for hell, which is Gehenna. Gehenna is this region that was just outside of Jerusalem. That's where the old evil testament kings would burn their children to the pagan gods. That's where good King Josiah therefore rightfully declared this is an unclean place. And that's why the people of Jerusalem would bring their garbage there every day and burn it right there in that region. And so it was this idea of uncleanness burning with fire and an unending fire. Now imagine being in that fire. It would be unimaginable pain. That's what Jesus emphasizes with what he says next. He quotes the prophet Isaiah. In fact, it's the very last passage and idea in the whole book of Isaiah. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. A worm eating through a dead body is kind of a gross picture, right? But imagine if that per body is alive. And that worm doesn't die. It never stops eating away. Again, not a pretty picture. Do you and I soften these pictures that Jesus himself used? They're uncomfortable, but they're uncomfortable for a reason. These are grave warnings. This is unimaginable pain. This is the death of anything good and happy. And this is forever. And that is exactly what Jesus saved us from. You and I could not cut out sin from our lives. Hand, foot, eye, whatever else, there'd be nothing left. That cancerous sin infected our, our minds and our hearts. You and I cling to these selfish sins and we choke down these rotten sins that affect others. And you and I were just waiting to be thrown into that fire. But Jesus came, wrestled that sin from us, choked down that rotten punishment, and threw himself in the fire for you and me. Now, instead of being he headed toward death and, and the death of anything good and happy, it's like God does a complete 180 for us. He sets us on a path to life and where everything good and happy will be forever. You see what the gospel does for us? It makes us Salty. Now instead of things being bland, flavorless, or even rotten, now it's seasoned and forgiven. Flavorful. For the rest of time. And imagine what that gospel does for us in this life. Imagine what things would be like without the gospel. Look at how much flavor it adds to everything. The world tries to get us to swallow this moldy, rotten sin, and yet instead we have this flavorful forgiveness. We have this eternal joy and this hope. The devil wants us to be less salty in this world, but no, God helps preserve that salt in you and I through the gospel. He keeps us connected to the gospel in worship and Bible study and the sacrament, daily devotions at home. God purifies us from all that is rotten 
and seasons everything around us. And that includes all of our relationships. Imagine what that would be like without the gospel. We'd have the rottenness and the bitterness of bickering and fighting. No, instead we have fellowship and encouragement. We get to celebrate a peace together that Christ has won for us. We get to join together in sharing that peace with others. We get to be salty. You see how things are way different because of the gospel? It adds flavor. It preserves. It purifies. It's like the gospel makes us a big walking container of Morton iodized salt. Wherever you go, things around you and inside of you are salty now, thanks to Jesus. And God wants you to keep that salt within yourselves. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Jesus has given us such flavor, but what happens if we lose that flavor? Well, what are you good for then? Salt that doesn't do anything is good for nothing. So instead, we let the gospel do its thing. We let it make us salty. We let it motivate us to help cut sin out of our lives. We stay connected to it so that it can help preserve our faith. And we let the peace that we have permeate into our relationships with others. When we do that, everything around us just becomes salty. Can you taste it? It's like it's in the air. You are all so salty. Do you think the rest of Bangor can taste it? Rockland? West Salem? Barry Mills? Sparta? I'm a terrible cook. Nothing I can do is flavorful except what God has done for me and you. He's made us flavorful where it matters most. So continue to let the gospel make you salty. God's blessings on your mission work near and far, brothers and sisters. Amen. Please stand. May the salt of the gospel guard and preserve your faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Join together to confess our faith in what Jesus did for us according to the ancient creed that all the world has been confessing throughout the centuries called the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, when unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We bring forward the offering.
We continue with the prayer of the church. Uh, as part of the prayer of the church, we pray for all of those facing health challenges in our congregation and beyond, including uh, a little boy named Tucker Carlson that Heather and I knew from California. He's dealing with some spinal fluid issues uh, all the way down his back, so we'll pray for him. We'll also pray for those celebrating anniversaries and birthdays this week. We pray. Merciful Lord of heaven, we praise you for the message of forgiveness and grace we have in Jesus. Forgive us for the times we have not honored this message in our hearts and lives, and continually purify us in the knowledge of Christ crucified. Give us wisdom, patience, and courage as we share this message with all around us. Father, make your power known in the minds and hearts of all who are faced with health challenges this week, especially Tucker Kelly, a friend of the Growth family. As they face their challenges, Lord, give their bodies strength and healing. Bless their work of doctors and nurses who provide for their care. Holy Spirit, please make your presence known in the lives of those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, as well as those newly married. Strengthen them to trust even more in your faithful promises and continue to bless their relationships with the peace won for them by Christ. We ask all of these things in the name of our Savior Jesus, who also taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand in honor of the gospel and the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. Yeva rechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'yichunecha, yesap Adonai panav elecha v'yesem lecha shalom. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Good morning again. It's a pleasure to worship with you here on this rainy Sunday and yet celebrating very fittingly the fact that God has a harvest, not just in our fields, but also out there in the mission field. So always a pleasure to worship with you there. A big welcome to our visitors. If you're visiting with us, uh, please let me know. We've got a guest book back there. You can also send me an email if you'd like to connect. I'd love to learn more about you and uh, tell you more about St. Paul's. Today we've got Bible study and Sunday school with a big change. Uh, we're, we're starting this Sunday moving forward, going to all be in one building. So the Sunday school will be here in the sanctuary. Uh, please find your teachers there, but the, the youngins will be back in that entryway for today. I believe the older students will be up in the balcony. Uh, so we'll meet here uh, for Sunday school soon. We'll also have Bible study down below in the church basement. Now that's normally Bible study, but today since it's Mission Sunday, we're going to have a, a special presentation on the wells work in India through that mission in the wells. So uh, down there about 9.15 is when we'll start that. So grab some uh, coffee and whatnot, beat me to all the cookies and, and get ready for uh, talking about what God does in the world. Tuesday and Wednesday we have a Bible study once again. Tuesday night, 7 p.m., Wednesday, 9 a.m. We're looking at world religions and, and really it's kind of a neat way to look at how no matter what religion someone else has, you can always share the gospel with them and you find different ways to do that. So we'll continue looking at that on Tuesday and Wednesday. Please note that uh, there's revised calendars there. Uh, there are a couple of mistakes in the last one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, they've been revised and you can pick up a new one there. Maybe you already have there by the bulletins. We're looking for some help for the diorama Live Nativity. That's coming up here. We're going to be on the last Sunday for that, or last uh, days of that for our church. I think it's like December 18th and 19th. Uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, to help prepare, that actually starts now. It's been going on for a little bit. So Mondays and Wednesdays from 6.30 to 9 p.m. at the Rotary Building there. Uh, they need help with repairs and prep. So if you're, if you're able to help, please see the note in the news and announcements. October is also a very active month in the wells around this area. I've been getting emails all week about different events coming up here, and so I've included a number of them there in the news and announcements. I'll let you read through which ones are available to you, but God be praised, lots of uh, glorifying to him this month as we get ready for Reformation. And speaking of that, there's an area Reformation rally again this year, uh, Sunday, October 31st. It falls right on Reformation Day, 2 p.m., at the chapel at Luther High. So please see that note and uh, hope to see you there. Other things we can uh, check out there in the news and announcements, but may God continue to bless you as you remain salty, not just in your life, but with those around you. God's blessings on your mission work. Please greet one another. <laughs> 